is Jamie Lindau, and today we're going to talk about the second installment of the series about trying to build self-storage, and that's finding land, which I believe is the hardest part of all mini storage development, is finding the right piece of property. And uh, the, um, let's looking at a piece of land that we're looking at right here. This is a nice self-storage facility that's right on a main road, and man, that's what everybody is trying to build. But what makes it that it will be a good piece of land? What are the characteristics you're looking for? And here I have them listed on how I think is most important. Close to the population, okay? Great visibility. It used to be high visibility, but now it has switched for close to the population, I think is more important. And then hopefully you get a big enough parcel that you can expand and make a larger site because most of the facilities over time will run out of land. Hopefully you add grading, hopefully you get the land for pretty cheap, and of course, you hopefully the city will let you build it. To get every one of these items is pretty much impossible, but we're gonna talk about how to um, positively say which one should be the best one or not to do. Now I'm gonna go right to the first one, which is close to the population. Now, if you look at this picture here, this is a site in Yakima, Washington, where they built a mini storage right near where all the people are. It's not on the best road, but it doesn't matter because what is important is, what has changed everything is the advent of the cell phone. Because the cell phone tells you exactly where you are. This phone is, it knows exactly its placement and it knows exactly where um, the facilities are. And so that's why when you get them close to you, and um, by saying a lot of people who rent self-storage will just look in their phone, click it, and say, um, self-storage closest to me. And when they do that, it's going to try to find the ones nearest to them. That's why you want to have a facility close to people. Very important. Next thing with high traffic. Hopefully you get something, in the old days you always wanted around um, 15,000 cars a day. The big REITs would always like that. We usually say around 5,000 cars a day. The more the better. And hopefully it's to and from work traffic or in a retail area. That's important. Third thing is hopefully you buy a big enough parcel that you can expand because there is some weird math in self-storage. If you want to try to make the most money, there's optimal pieces where if you look here, that if you can get to about 500 units, you're going to be have a much better facility to sell if you ever want to, and they'll pay you the highest amount of money for it because everybody wants this type. Normally, with about 500 units, you only need one person when you have about 600 units or more, a lot of times you need two people to work. Okay. Now when you're also looking at land, you're going to have to understand topography. And topography, you can get grading issues. For example, this photograph here just has probably 12 feet of drop from left to right. And that's easy. Now in this photo right here, we built a two-story into a hill to take out 10 feet of the drop. And you were able to work this grade in. And really, you can work even much more drastic grades. Here's a 24-foot, basically buying a hillside. But you're able to manipulate the buildings to be able to uh, make the project work. Now we're going to get to some of the real essences of the land. What is the true cost of the land? Okay, It's not that it's, let's say, $3 per square foot. It's, you know, I have seen many things where people get, hey, I have a really good deal on land. It's only $300,000. I go, well, yeah, but the land drops 30 feet in it. So therefore, you have a huge grading cost. If you have water and sewer there, you can pay more for the land because then you don't have to bring it or put in septic if that's something. Or if you're in a lot of the states that force you to do sprinkler systems, is water on the property, so therefore it'll make it cheaper if you have to have these sprinklers. And sometimes in industrial parks, the land that's being sold already has the retention pond, and they've taken care of the water drainage. You can pay a lot more 
for the land because you don't have to lose this part of the land for the retention pond. Because, for example, a retention pond normally costs around $100,000 at least, um, depending on where you are. And uh, I personally have run in this last issue on two out of the three projects I have just bought. It's what is the soils on the land. Because the soil condition can change what you have to do um, to be able to make it work or not work. So everyone always asks me the same questions. How much can I pay for land? And it really is not a one quick answer. And so what we have is on our website, Vitrocki, we have this investment calculator. And I'm going to run through an example for you quickly so you get an idea of land. We can input all kinds of items. How much is the land? How much does it cost to build it? The construction, rental rates, management fees, and kind of gives you an estimated break even. Now here's my example. Here, if you can look closely at this uh, investment calculator, we're saying we're going to pay $700,000 on for these four acres of land. We are going to, now we're not actually drawing a plan, but you can get some best guesses before wasting any money. Because what I'm talking about here is how you investigate without spending a lot of money. And so I'm saying you're going to have uh, drive up units, get about 35% coverage, you're going to get over 60,000 square feet. And um, the uh, I'm going to say you're going to build the whole project at $50 a square foot. Now I'm just putting in the exact same thing here. Each one of these could be a whole seminar just to talk about. And then on the next slide, we're going to say how much was the whole development cost? What is the revenue that you're going to get? What is the rental rate? And by the way, that is the biggest key to all this Performa items is because what do you get? If the rates are very low, you can't pay as much for the money. The rates are really the key driver. And uh, the next is what could your gross income be? How much are you going to, what is your operating expense? How do you plan to run it? The tendency after this pandemic is a lot of people are trying to mitigate the amount of people on site. Therefore, they're making their expenses much lower. And that's another topic that we're going to have, just how to do that in the future. And then we look at this last sheet, it talks about what interest rates, now the interest rates are incredibly low at the moment. I'm putting 4% here. If you do a, um, you can borrow up to 90% of the value. I'm saying that we're going to rent 2,000 square feet a month. And uh, when we're really full, we normally, many storages, stay at about 85 to 90 percent occupied. Now if we look at this last slide, it's going to tell me where my break-even is. At 700,000, I break even in 22 months and I, my break-even is 69 percent occupied. Now if you look on the left here, I just did this four different ways to say how much money I'm spending on the land, whether it's 500,000, 7, 1 million, 1 million, 400,000 for the exact same parcel and it shows you the difference. What you're going to see is that um, the land price doesn't change as much as you would think as far as uh, whether you can afford it or not. And um, the, uh, so I'm a huge fan of, I'm not, I do not believe you should just buy the most inexpensive land because you should buy the best land you can find and you pay more because Three, three things are going to happen. The first thing is you're going to get, be able to get more rent or push the rents up. You're going to rent up faster because it's going to be a better place. And the real truth is the cost of our building, anybody's building, to build it is the same. I don't care where you build it, it's going to be the same. And, or close to the same, just the land cost is really what's changing. Some grading cost, of course, too, but uh, that's super important. Now, everyone that has calls us and talks about self-storage can find parcels of land that will work. That's great, except that the city may or may not allow you to build it there. It's super easy to find a good location. It's just where the city will let you build. 
And this is the entire game right here, where the city will allow you to build. And traditionally, we've been not only been able to build on industrial commercial zoning, in many places only industrial, or the, that is where you get what's called use by right. And then later, a lot of townships across the United States have changed that they are making you have a conditional use permit, CUP. So they still want to dictate how it looks and what, your, what it looks like. So what happens is you have to do investigation on the townships you're looking at. Is what zoning is it allowed? And I'm going to show you here an example. In Topeka, Kansas, I just looked. I don't care what town you're in. Go to the town. I'm in the town of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. I'm in the town of wherever you are. Look at the city planning meeting or at the city uh, website and type in zoning and type in self-storage, mini storage, mini warehouse and you're going to get a lot of information. Now in Topeka, Kansas here, if you look at these circles I have, is that it's allowed on commercial or industrial. And what's called use by right is all on the industrial. That's where you could build standard mini storage outside access with RV and boat storage. But with these others where it says C and S, conditional or uh, special use permits, is there's a lot more restrictions for that. And what they have in the C2 zoning is that only indoor units. So you have to have no doors facing the street. Okay? And very similar to C3 and C4. Special uses are normally much easier to get than conditional uses. And that's what it's kind of showing here. Okay? Like, for example, the C2 zoning, most likely you would have to have a large buildings that are very fancy on the outside, won't even look like a mini storage, and uh, could be one story or two story. So here's like a one story that would be in this type of use group. It doesn't really look like a cell storage, it is, uh, but it is inside one. That's a one story. Or a multi-story would look like this, have this kind of fanciness on the outside. Then you can be in these zones. Now, once you determine where the zonings are, or what the zoning is, then there is going to be a zoning map for every community. It's going to be online, and here is one shown. So if you've got to determine what zonings are going to allow you on, and then here, like these red circles, are the targeted zonings that we're allowed to build self-storage. So one of the things that you should do is try to chase down the correctly zoned pieces of property. Okay? Now it might not be for sale, okay? or it might be for sale, and I have done better chasing ones down that weren't even for sale. You just try to meet who the owner is and see if you can purchase it. But a lot of times with these existing zonings that are there, there might, already, it might not be vacant land, there might be something there. Like here, this is a site that I had purchased. It was basically a junkyard. And, but it was correctly zoned. And therefore, I could take that and transfer it, buy it, and then put self-storage there. And that was easier to do than trying to do a zone change. Now, when you have a zone change, now you have a lot of hoops to go through. A lot of times you have to hire a professional to help you, and it'll take a long time to be able to get this done. Again, how to do a zone change, it's a whole nother seminar that we might have, or webinar that we'll have at some point. Now what has happened across the country, we have had a huge boom in self-storage, and a lot of the communities don't really like self-storage, okay? That they, they do not create jobs, and they do not, uh, they're not uh, buoyant to make the economy better in that little community just in our town right here that I live in, Mattis, Wisconsin. In the last week, they were trying to convert an old grocery store, or an old, uh, it's called a Shopco store, and it was shot down by the township because of those issues. So these are things you have to look at. Other areas of the countries have put moratoriums on self-storage. You better know that up front if there is such a thing. There's multiple places 
that is because they're trying to slow it down. And here's just an example of one. So, now I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just telling you what the hurdles are that you're going to face. So my suggestion, where you begin, is you cast a very large net on where you want to look for self-storage. Multiple places, 20 mile range, you know, four communities, and you start looking, okay? Because it could take a very, very long time. And um, so, you know, each one will have its own zoning, you know. Um, the one that I showed you earlier that I bought was existing. I, my second son was wanting to build one. It was our fourth property we put a contract in. You know, it didn't, it took two and a half years to be able to find that parcel which to build from. So this is not something that is easy to go overnight. Okay? One of the things you want to do is now build a team. I suggest if you decide to find a commercial real estate broker to help you, it's very important that they can help Bird Dog to find out um, what the zonings are for you and help you make it happen because my other son decided to build a mini storage and the actual, the real estate broker figured it out that where there's a possibility of a zone change that actually all went to fruition. So if you get a good real estate broker, it'd be good, good. Now what happens is most people look for land using what's called LoopNet, okay? They look online, this is a free service, everybody can put in, you put in uh, land, and uh, here at Topeka, Kansas, some land, and it's going to show you everything available. And that's what this thing shows here. It takes you two seconds to go look at that. That's going to show you available parcels and other things that are there. Now, what happens with a lot of the land? For example, just giving you our own example, the land that we eventually per we purchased originally started at 2.8 million. And it went to 2.3 million, 1.9 million, 1.8 million. Okay? The first bid we threw in was 1 million. And in the end, went to 1.1 million. And in the end, after some gyrations, went to 1.3 million. So a lot of these are sky high, especially if they've been there for a very long time, because people gave up on them. Because a lot of these had problems. This land that we purchased had problems. So, yes, it shows you a number, but you just throw in a bid, too. Now, with a real estate broker, my older brother is a real estate broker, he uses this thing called CoStar, which that's something you have to pay for, and it also gives you comparative land sales nearby and all kinds of other data. That is one of the arsenals of the real estate broker, can help you in determining what it needs to be able to find. Now, what has happened is there's a whole bunch of people out there that we see them every week that are finding land that is already zoned or correctly zoned or they got it zoned and then trying to sell it ready to go. And here, I just typed in self-storage land for sale, you know, and type that in to see what I came, came in for, just to show you. Just ways that you can do some investigation on your own with your own computer. And like here, like here's one that came out with Argus Real Estate. There is a number of people that specialize in self-storage where you can buy just the land or they're trying to sell the land already approved plus of course sell a self-storage that you might want to purchase and add land to all kinds of other things. Now when you're going to look for a piece of land okay you know the key is to get it under contract okay I had screwed up before where I started to try to get all the approval process with I had a verbal agreement with the owner but I did not get it under contract and I wasted time and energy and money getting it approved and the guy backed out on me I vow to never ever ever do that again I am going to get it under contract the key is get it under contract I cannot tell you how many people talk to us at Trocty Building System and they say things like, I know I want to get into mini storage, I know my name, I know the Unimix I want, I know all this stuff, but they do not have the land under contract. 
You have nothing, my friend, nothing, until you get the land under contract. And so that's why you're going to have to have verbiage for the contract. How long can you hold the land before you know, you know you can build it? If it's correctly zoned, it's going to take you 90, 120 days. So you want to get four months. Okay? But if you need a zone change, it could take a year. Now what happens is the landowner does not want to do that for you. They're going to want a hole. And, you know, this is huge, this contract language. Now I'm not getting into the specifics, but the danger is the owner of the land forces you to buy it because he's not going to wait. And then you buy the land. This has happened from where I'm sitting right now, four miles away. A person bought 15 acres. He thought you could get it changed. The city shot him down. Now he owns this land, doesn't know what to do with it. That is the absolute worst case scenario. It happens all the time. Okay? Don't, it's, they're all going to want to pressure you to do it. Unless they're stealing the land, then that's fine. Now, a lot of times when you have fine land that you're trying to determine if you can build self-storage on or need to get a zone chain, a lot of times you have to do mixed use. Like this is in New Jersey where the customer had to show that we employed 20 people on this property. And so he had far di or, excuse me, five different offices and then he had self-storage in the back and they allowed that. So there's some unusual things that happen with zoning. Like here's one out in North Dakota where they had a whole apartments on the front that's, and then self-storage in the back. So there is things that have changed. Now I'm talking to everybody across the U.S. and some areas are very easy to find self-storage land and some are very hard. What I've kind of found is that states that collect sales tax on self-storage rent, Florida for example, they are much more susceptible to allowing self-storage because this town's making money. Madison, Wisconsin that collects no sales tax, they're not interested at all. They only get property tax. Okay, And so um, some states, Texas, some areas of Texas, for example, don't have zoning so you can go where you want, you know, or other rural communities, but uh, it's different. Now, you know, Townships should like us, but they don't. We're a buffer, we have quiet, but a lot of them don't. So you're going to find in some areas, you know, you're pretty much disliked, you know, and so you have to come with a good response when you go into the planning department meetings to be able to get this land approved. Now, what I believe with this pandemic that has just happened is that we're having a lot of buildings that are becoming vacant because of the changing in retail market, okay? And so what happens if you're going to look for an existing building to convert, you have a much better chance of getting a zone change. It might be in just commercial zoning, but this building is existing and it's been empty for three years or two years or whatever. The townships are much more like it, uh, likely to let it go or let you build it. Like here, back to LoopNet again, here is an existing building that you're looking at might have some vacant land that you could maybe add on to it. And many people out there, if you travel around the country, um, U-Haul has been doing it all, all over the place. They're buying all the old Sears and Kmarts, like this is an old Kmart that U-Haul bought. And then they're actually trying to put portable storage on the parking lot or regular buildings on the parking lot if it's allowed but you got to make sure that the city would allow it. So. Now, a part of this, I'm going to talk about what you shouldn't do, okay? This is what you should not do. You should not talk to your loan guy who want to get a loan commitment because you don't have the land yet. You're wasting time, okay? You're wasting their time, okay? You need the land. You're going to call a company like us and want building quotes on land you do not exist. Basically, you should just work with ballpark. You should not hire a civil engineer yet until you actually have land which you to spend money on. But you should know who to buy and you should do investigation on who your civil engineer will be to make sure you can conform to whatever the hurdles are. And 
Now, before you submit anything to a township, like a zone change or, hey, I want to see if it's allowed, most townships are going to say, you have to prove you either A, own the land, or B, have the land under contract. That you have to show them a signed copy of this contract before you can submit to even start the process. So that is why back to the, the contract language that you have it for a long enough time to be able to do it. And it gets dangerous because you're going to want to have this contract language be for free for a year. And a lot of times that owner won't, have, won't happen. For example, the last one that I did, I got six months for free, then it was 5000 a month after that if I extended it. We made up a determination in the beginning whether I'm going to bail or not. And I had to pay to be able to do it. I eventually bought the land when I actually knew it could be built. And then I just bought it so I didn't have to pay the 5000 But it's just something that you know you might have to do. So like here, this is a, down in uh, South Carolina. This is a very nice site. Look at it, it faces the front. They did wide buildings, it's climate control. They're getting very good coverage. Their retention pond is on the right hand side. Look in the back, they have room to expand. This is a very nice site. It sounds easy to find, but you have, um, you know, this would be what, this is the goal for most people because then you get it into a very large size because, um, you know, what has been great about self-storage is that it has continued to grow as a business and especially if you pick the right site, you will have very good success. Now, um, this pretty much concludes this seminar that I have, our webinar right now. And is there any questions that anybody wants to talk specifically about it? I get, I feel uh, dangerous telling you how much you can pay per square foot. You know, um, I will tell you what I have paid somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 a square foot for land. And I'm a fan of, if you can buy bigger land, I can pay a lot more money, especially if you're allowed to have boat RV parking because the Pot RV parking helps pay for the whole site while you're under construction, just having them park outside, which is inexpensive. There's a lot of different uh, things that you can do to be able to make it, um, make it happen for you. So, is there any questions? Um, the, uh, you know, the, the price you pay, most people are always going to say, the price you pay and how much does it cost to build. I put $50 on that. And what would be good is if when you look at um, that basic calculator, put $40 in, put $50 in, put $60 in, and you can see the changes. You know, put whatever the dollar amounts are as far. But really then watch what the rental rates are and you really can see the changes that can happen. And um, they, uh, so, very important. All right. So, um, so the, um, uh, how much land, people have asked how much land do you buy? How much land do you want? Um, the areas that you saw that wanted expandable land, you know, you would love to get five acres would be the dream to have five acres because then you get a very large site with a retention pond. But if you only get three acres, how do you cover it? Because then you look at, if you only find a two acre parcel, then you're looking to build multi-story and you might pay a million dollars for two acres but then you'll have to build it a multi-story, three-story type building, which of course the buildings get, you're not anywhere near $50 a square foot, you're near like $80 a square foot to build uh, multi-stories with all the elevators and everything else you might have to have on it. So, um, you know, the ones that I purchased, I like bigger if I can get them, 
One was 5.1 acres, the other one was 8.1 acres, the other one was 13 acres, but only uh, eight was buildable. I had wetlands, all kinds of other problems. Um, because I like to also build it that gets everything from climate control, boat RV. I want to be able to answer everybody and rent everybody. It's kind of my philosophy if it can happen. Now, there's other ones that were super expensive, might be two million dollars for three acres if you're in California or something, and then you're going to get, um, then you're going to be able to have to build a multi-story to be able to work. Now, people ask, what's the average unit size that a facility should have? It depends whether it's rural or urban. Uh, normally, it's about 110 to 120 square feet per unit. But one of the changes that have happened in our industry is that people are renting bigger spaces. They are using them. They might have only had a 10 by 10 before. Now they have grown to 10 by 15 or 10 by 20. And in the more rural communities or out west, like Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, we have very large units. The average unit might be 12 by 30, 12 by 40. Huge units because they have a bunch of toys. Because, you know, our lifestyles are changing. Many people are having boats, RVs, four-wheelers, all kinds of stuff. They're not traveling abroad. They're spending, camping, traveling, RVing here. So they need a much bigger space. And that's a growth market, without a doubt, that we are seeing. So. The danger of that, though, is you need a ton of land. Now it might not be as visible. And with the RV thing, I think it has to be way less visible. Though you have to have a reasonable just near, because people will drive 15 miles to get to the RV type of location. So, um, yeah. The, um, okay, I'm just reading what people are also saying. People ask, how do you determine if you can get a zone change? Well, that's, there's not one universal way. It's very dangerous. Uh, the townships, the cities are, um, I would say, in my town of Madison, Wisconsin, you're dead. You, they have forced you to have their zoning. And they also enacted township here, my town of Madison, Wisconsin, you have to be a multi-story. They do not allow you to do it in a one-story. It has to be multi-story. And they did that because they want to have density. They do not want to waste the land for it. And they want to get higher property tax. So then they can consolidate everything. They can get the $6 million project on two acres of land and collect their exorbitant huge property tax on those two acres. They have no problem with that. So that's what they're forcing you to do to be able to be built. Um, One person said, I found a huge parcel of land, but it's 12 to 15 minutes away. Okay, that's pretty far away, but it's for a boat RV that might work um, because there's nothing closer. Now, you really got to see what the competition is with the boat RV, um, what else is there, what is nearby. What you're finding, I rarely find anywhere that is oversaturated in RV. I do find self storage oversaturated. And you're going to see that by uh, the price is too inexpensive or there's some vacancy. But um, those are things that you would have to check. Um, all righty. Well, I want to thank you all for attending this webinar. And if you have any questions, um, you can contact me because I will um, help you at any time, if you want to send me an email at jlindau at trocty.com or look at some of the other videos uh, that we have um, specifically on if you're going to build the particular items. We'll be having every month or so, we're going to be continuing to do this webinar series to be able to give people a uh, step by step um, in developing hopefully a self storage business because I got to tell you. It is a business that you can get in because there is no brand association. You, John Smith, 
Jane Smith can own it and compete with the big person. If you find the parcel, you can be able to get your own business and have your own little American dream. That is what this industry allows you to have. Otherwise, have a great day and I want to thank you for coming.